clock has hit zero, and this one is in the books. It's time for Cougar Post Game Live on the new skin, BYU Sports Network. Now let's join your host, Jason Shepard. The BYU Cougars fall to 2-3 and three on the season, losing at Toledo today by a final of 28-21. Welcome back into our BYU Radio Studios in Provo, Utah. Jason Shepard with you. We'll get you back out to Toledo coming up in just a few minutes. Let you hear from players and coaches. Expecting to hear from the head coach of the BYU Cougars, Kalani Satake, coming up in just a few minutes. A, a very interesting second half. At half, it was 7-3 BYU, and BYU got the ball to start the third quarter. BYU scores 25 seconds into the third quarter. They lead 14-3, to and you kind of felt like with that lead, you score fast, the momentum, the confidence that BYU gathered that maybe BYU was going to get on this run and just kind of pick up steam and keep moving. Not only did it give BYU some juice, but it also gave Toledo an opportunity to kind of find their rhythm because right after that point, the scoring was kind of fast and furious, especially for Toledo. Toledo would get a field goal to come within 14-6, to and then ultimately uh, they would get uh, another touchdown to tie it up. They would get the two-point conversion at 14-14. BYU would then go ahead 21-14. The Toledo Rockets would come back and tie it up 21-21. And really for me... The biggest change in the second half was Mitchell Guadani, the quarterback of the Rockets, his scrambling ability. And if you look at his rushing numbers, they're not going to wow you based off of the stats alone. He had 12 rushes for 54 yards. That, that doesn't look like a lot. But his ability to scramble completely changed the dynamic for this Toledo offense in that second half. It opened everything up, and BYU's defense was never able to figure it out and slow him down, whether it was him actually getting rushing yards himself or his scrambling ability, allowing more time for his receivers to get open, and he was able to make a play. But but Guadani's legs and his ability to move in the pocket completely changed this game in favor of the Rockets. Uh, obviously, when you look at the rushing game alone, uh, Toledo, which – Hadn't uh, done very much in the first half, I believe. Had 74 rushing yards, finishes with 242. And and once again, BYU just really struggling to stop the run. Uh, Total, let's see, Seymour with 96. You had Kobach with 88. Already mentioned Guadani with 54. And then uh, Jones with 4 for 242. And BYU came in averaging 215 yards, given up 215.5 actually. And, uh, and the Rockets surpass that today as they get the win, 28-21. to Greg was talking about this on the broadcast, BYU's inability to be able to turn some of those longer drives into touchdowns uh, proved to be a big deal. And BYU won the turnover battle, 3-1. to BYU was plus two in the turnovers, uh, but that late turnover, after getting a turnover, a fumble from Kobach, Deep in BYU territory, the Cougars recover. On the very next play, BYU's offensive play, Zach Wilson throws an interception. And from the, after that play, we found out that Zach Wilson left. Uh, the report was he was holding his hand. Uh, we have not received any further information on his status. But Jaron Hall came in trying to get BYU down the field to tie this thing up in regulation and possibly go to overtime. Uh, but it was not for uh, it was not in the cards, and uh, BYU falls twenty-eight to twenty-one. All right, we'll take our first time out here on Cougar Post Game Live. When we come back, uh, we'll go th- through some scores in uh, other college football action today here on this Saturday. If there's an opportunity to hear from Kalani in our next segment, we will do that as well. Cougars fall to the Toledo Rockets twenty-eight twenty-one. They are now two and three on the season, heading into their bye week. So there's two weeks to sit on this one. We'll have more Cougar halftime, or excuse me, Cougar post game live coming up next on the new skin, BYU Sports Network. This is Cougar Post Game Live on the New Skin, BYU Sports Network. Now back to your host, Jason Shepard. The BYU Cougars fall on the road in Toledo, Ohio. Rockets defeating BYU by a final score of 28-21. 
The Rockets now 2-2 two and two on the season. BYU drops to 2-3, and three, heading into their bye week, back in action in two weeks on the road. They'll be heading down to Florida to take on South Florida. In the meantime, let's update you on some other action in college football today. All of the early games, uh, most of those are turning into finals right now. Number 8, Oklahoma. Defeating Texas Tech by a final score of 55-16. to It was 8th-ranked Wisconsin on top of Northwestern, 24-15. Number 23, Texas A&M wins on the road at Arkansas, 31-27. 14th-ranked Iowa Hawkeyes defeating Middle Tennessee, 48-3. Number 20, Michigan improves to 3-1 and overall, 1-1 one and one in the Big Ten. They shut out Rutgers, 52 to nothing. Uh, coming up in uh, just a few minutes, your uh, 1.30 kick time, at least 1.30 mountain time kick, include number one Clemson at North Carolina, also at 130 Mountain, number two Alabama hosting Ole Miss, uh, 18th ranked Virginia at number 10 Notre Dame. That one will also get underway at 130. A uh, big one in the Pac-12, number 17 Washington hosting number 21 USC. Indiana will be on the road at number 25 Michigan State. A little bit later on this afternoon, 9th ranked Florida hosting Towson. Mississippi State will be at number 7 Auburn. UConn traveling to Orlando to take on 22nd ranked Central Florida at 5 o'clock Mountain Time in Stillwater, Oklahoma State. State hosting 24th ranked K State, the fifth ranked Ohio State Buckeyes. I probably need to say the Ohio State. I may don't know. I may get sued for not saying that properly. They're on the road at Nebraska at 5:30 Mountain Time. The University of Utah, 19th ranked in the country, at home tonight at 8 Mountain, hosting Washington State. And then just to update you on uh, some games involving top 25 teams. From yesterday, number 12 Penn State shutting out Maryland 59-0 and Arizona State upsets 15th-ranked California last night 24-17. to Number 9, BYU women's volleyball in action taking on Portland. It's Game 2 of the West Coast Conference schedule. The first set has concluded up in the Pacific Northwest. BYU wins the first set 25-20. In set number two, uh, Portland right now leading two to nothing, but uh, BYU on top uh, with one set to none. Don't forget also tonight at Southfield, BYU women's soccer, fifth ranked in the country, coming in with a record of 9-0, and looking to remain unbeaten as they wrap up non-conference play against the Anteaters of UC Irvine. I will be on the call along with Avery Walker. We'll have that for you here on the New Skin BYU Sports Network. We will go on the air at 6.30 p.m. Mountain Time with pregame, and then we'll uh, have the kickoff at Southfield uh, a little after 7 o'clock mountain time all right we'll take uh, one more final break come back uh, either wrap it up uh, or if head coach Kalani Sataki is there we'll let you hear from the head coach of the Cougars after BYU falls at Toledo 28 21 we'll have mo- more of Cougar Post Game live next on the new skin BYU Sports Network Let's rejoin Jason Shepard for more Cougar Post Game Live on the new skin, BYU Sports Network. The BYU Cougars losing on the road at Toledo 28 21. The final Rockets getting the victory. BYU now on uh, the first of two bye weeks this season. They'll have two weeks to regroup and get ready for a battle against South Florida two weeks from now in Florida. Uh, one of the quick. Uh, uh, updates on BYU women's volleyball, number nine in the country. Again, after winning set one, 25-20, they are tied in set number two at four apiece. All right, uh, head coach Kalani Sataki should be coming out in just a few minutes, so we're going to wrap things up for our coverage here in Provo. We'll take a break. On the other side, Greg Rubel and Riley Nelson will have the Cougar, uh, Cougar Locker Room Show. That's coming your way next, BYU Falling on the road at Toledo, 28-21, your final score. We'll have more of Cougar Post Game Live next on the new skin, BYU Sports Network. Welcome back to post game coverage of BYU football on the new skin, BYU Sports Network. Our coverage continues with the Cougar Locker Room Show. Cougar Locker Room Show is brought to you by Utah Community Credit Union. Get more house, same payment at UCCU. It's what we do. Let's head live to the Mo Betta's broadcast booth and join Riley Nelson, along with the voice of the Cougars, Greg Rubel. 
All right, this is the uh, Cougar Locker Room Show coming your way from the Glass Bowl in Toledo. Rockets 28, BYU 21, BYU defensive back Diane Gawoliku speaking to media outside the BYU Locker Room. Let's join him live. Last touchdown after the interception. Were you guys just letting them score there? No, we're, we're not going to let them just score. Like, well, you get the ball back that way. But still, we try to get a stop. Like He got in. Obviously, we had time to score, and we just didn't stop him. That was a good run by him and physical run. Defensively, it seemed that you guys... You know, there was a big difference between the first half and the second half. What kind of adjustments made it more difficult for you guys to stop the offense from moving the ball and scoring points in the second half? It wasn't even like it wasn't even like big difference on their part, but they just like I said, their quarterback got them out of a lot of trouble. Uh, when things weren't open, he made a play, just ran the ball, and so we had to do a better job in containing him. What did you see on Chaz's strip there at the end? Got Jason Tallman. Chaz played a good game and. Like, playmakers make plays, and he's a playmaker, and we got to have a lot more of that in all four quarters. And we just have to do a better job. That's all it is. Got to finish the game. What do, you, how do you, what do you build off of from this one? How do you, how do you take it moving forward? Just don't take any team for granted. Everyone's talking about how four games, the first four games are going to be the toughest, but the season, is, it's all going to be tough. Like, teams aren't just going to come out there and, like, think they're not going to win. Like, everyone's thinking they're going to win, so it's like, we we'll come out there and just every, game, every game is going to be a dogfight, and we just got to fight harder. Right here. Okay. Thanks, Diane. Sure. All right, we'll take a break. Cougar Locker Room Show continues. Fans, title and escrow can be complicated with over 50 years' experience in Utah. Provo Land Title has the expertise to navigate your buying, selling, or building project. Provo Land Title, making the complicated easier. More from the Cougar Locker Room, including, in fact, let's go down to Coach Kalani Sitake before the break right now. Probably going to be out for a little bit, and... Uh, how long that is, is, is uh, we still have to evaluate it and get some more um, opinions on it and everything. But, yeah, so that's we'll have to be ready for that. There was a comment about quarterback Zach Wilson's hand injury. In the um, – After the fumble. After Chaz's strip. Yeah, I thought there was enough time. I mean, a little under a minute. We had three timeouts, and um, – you know, we've been throwing the ball pretty well and, and getting some, some yardage on them. And, and, and so I uh, just really wanted, to, with the time left and the amount of timeouts that we had, I thought it was good for us to go for it. And, uh, obviously, they made a big play on it and got the interception, and that cost us. So uh, that, that was, uh, we have a lot of work to, to get done in the next, you know, we have a bye week, so we've got to evaluate a lot of things and look at it and, and get better before we go to South Florida for the next game. Like it was inconsistent on both sides. You have stretches where they play really well, and have stretches mm-hmm. where they, they kind of struggle. And credit to you know Toledo for some of that. But how do you kind of build on that and try and get those, those consistent stretches? It's, it's been kind of the issue you had is the, the inconsistency on on you know in all three phases basically. And so we we had some missed field goals today, and um, although we had some good returns, uh, we just never really could generate momentum. Even though when we had it, we seemed to give it up quite a bit. And, you give credit to Toledo. They made some plays. They made more plays than we did, you know, and obviously the score shows it. But uh, I thought it was a tough battle. But they, they converted on fourth downs. We didn't, you know, and um, they made their field goals. We didn't. And so, you know, looking at, at uh, evaluating all of it, I think as a coach, I, I need to do what's best for the team and then figure things out and try to get this so we play playing at our best against South Florida. And that, that really means everything that we have to look at and evaluate. They do stuff differently in the second half. Uh offensively where you were unable to stop them adjustments? Oh, I, think, I think they did a, uh, a lot of the similar things in the first half. They, they Pretty much the adjustments were maybe to throw the comebacks a little bit more and, and do a little bit more of the RPOs. But, uh, you know, I, I thought they made more plays and, and it seemed like they just trusted the run game, kept trying to force feed it to the running back. And, you know, we didn't do enough to really – I don't know what the exact stats were, but uh, we knew they were going to run the ball. We didn't do enough to really uh, – force the issue and make them have to go to the, the air as much as we wanted. And that's something that we have to evaluate and make sure that we get it done next time. What's that emotion like on the sideline as a coach and players when you get the strip and then all of a sudden just one play later, later give it back and basically you know end up giving up you know that position? That's hard. I mean, but I mean, I mean that's that's the game, right? They made the play, we didn't, and um, don't want to take anything away from Toledo. We we had some good support here. We we had some noise going for our defense and. Uh, they're a really good team, you know. I think they're they're going to do some damage in their conference play, but um, we really didn't help ourselves with some of the mistakes that we made. And you know, that's something that, that 
I have to address as head coach and some things that we got to make sure that we play more consistent. That's what I, that's my job. I got to get that done. How different do you think the game would have gone had Jake made those two field goals? Did it affect the momentum or just mentality of the players? I mean, it would have been nice to have a padded, uh, more score, you know, a bigger lead. But the truth is that um, uh, nobody plays perfect. Our guys played with a lot of effort. They, they gave us everything they had. They had tons of energy. Uh, we just weren't able to capitalize and make plays. I think on, you know, trying to keep drives alive on 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 offense and then defense get them off the field. You know, and we weren't able to do that consistently enough. And that's that's uh, that's what I got to get done. What did you tell him, or what did you talk to him about? Well, he just wasn't. I mean, he wasn't kicking very well today, and and uh, you know, we we thought he was punting pretty good, but his his. Uh, Field goals and stuff, the kicks just weren't there. So we went to Skyler and the PATs and things like that. That's why we travel those two kickers just in case one of them doesn't do well. I think Jake was a little bit under under the weather, but still he, we, we, we expect him to make those kicks. Talk about what Darren did. I mean, you threw him in a, into a tough situation, needing to try and drive down for a touchdown. Talk about his, his performance. At yeah, it was a hard spot, spot to throw him into, you know, but he was ready for it, and he's got tons of confidence. And then... Uh, there's some things that we can do with him at the quarterback that, that uh, gives us a, a little bit of an advantage. But, uh, you know, I'm glad we have another week to get ready because it looks like he's probably going to be the guy going against South Florida. Throughout practice this week, did you have any sense that you guys would come out this flat or just, just one of those things? On offense? I thought defensively we came out. I, I don't think the flat thing was really a whole – you can't say that about the whole team, you know, that uh, offense didn't score enough points and, and defense was doing good in the beginning and – uh, halftime, we felt good about about what we're doing defensively. We just couldn't generate enough enough momentum as a team. So uh, the energy was there. The guys were playing hard. I don't I don't think flat is the right word to use. Anything else? What, what did you say to him after this game? Oh, we just got to go back to work. I mean, I told him how much I loved him and and much I appreciate how how uh, the effort they gave today. But we got to get better. And um, this is this is one of those things where the guys give us everything they have, and we've got to make the good decisions on, on as a coaching staff to make sure that we're playing more consistent. All right, thanks. Okay, thanks, guys. Hey, thanks. All right, that's BYU head coach Kalani Sitake. Cougar Locker Room Show continues after this on the new skin, BYU Sports Network. This is the Cougar Locker Room Show on the new skin, BYU Sports Network. Now back to the voice of the Cougars, Greg Rubel. Mitchell Jurgens and media talking with Micah Simon outside the BYU locker room. Let's go there. Jaron, go out there for that last. I mean, he's a tough situation for him to come in, you know, kind of his first opportunity as a true quarterback and, you know, gave you guys at least a shot there on the last play. Yeah, no doubt. Um, you know, I mean, he's, he works hard in practice and he's always ready for, for his time. And, uh, and, yeah, he put us in a good position, uh, you know, really, really hard position trying to move, go, go the length of the field in whatever, 50 seconds. But, uh, yeah, he gave us a shot. That's all you can ask for. When you guys took over after the fumble uh, after Chaz's strip, uh, was it all talk being aggressive, going down and trying to score? Was there any talk of maybe playing for overtime? Or no, we were, we were, we were going to go score. Uh-huh. Yeah, we were going to be aggressive and, and go score and win the game. Yeah, Kal- Kalani may mention that uh, you know, Zach most likely won't be playing the next game. It will be Jaron's, Jaron's game against South Florida. How confident are you guys in Jaron you know, taking the helm and, and leading you guys to a victory? He's super confident. I know the type of work he's put in all offseason. You know, I just back to spring ball when Zach was out and you know, the type of player that he is. And then, and then like, you know, we got two weeks to prepare, so I know he'll be ready and we'll, we'll have his back and we'll be, we'll be good to go. What was that emotion like when you had that last, you know, the only turnover of the game because you'd just gotten on that high, an opportunity to go win it, and then all of a sudden it's going the other way. And just, you know, that's, that's a heartbreaking moment. Yeah, uh, definitely is, um, you know, really swing of emotion of, of happiness for, you know, our defense getting the ball back for us. And I, I was I was confident we were going to be able to move the ball down and then just, you know, it happened and got the pick and it was just, you know, it was just, yeah, frustration. And uh, but you kind of had to stay ready because we knew we would have gotten the ball back um, and we did and we just yeah, almost almost made it happen. Did they tell you guys what's wrong with Zach in the locker room or anything? No, nah, I, I don't. I don't know, and I didn't even know he was uh, he was out. Like I ran on the field and I just kind of looked back and saw three was that quarterback. I was like, all right, here we go. <laughs> what do you say to the boys? What'd you say after the game? As one of the leaders on this team, and you've been through these you've been through these tough losses. So yeah, uh, I mean, I, I for sure told them that that uh, 
you know, I'm tired of losing. I'm tired of uh, of this feeling, and that is definitely a, a gut check for us as a, as a team. And it's 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 time for everybody to look in the mirror and uh, and kind of self reflect and, and see how much you uh, how much you know you kind of you really care about this and how much you know you're gonna how much effort you're gonna put in the rest of the season to make sure that you don't have this feeling again. And uh, you know, as a, as a senior, as a leader, you know, it's 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 my job to kind of kind of do this and, and and try to help everybody, you know, keep themselves up, but know that you know we're we're super disappointed in this loss and that um, you know we'll we'll bounce back. Okay, cool. Thanks, Appreciate it. All right, Michael Simon down at the Cougar locker room area. The Cougar locker room show continues from Toledo on the New Skin BYU Sports Network. This is the Cougar Locker Room Show on the new skin, BYU Sports Network. Now back to the voice of the Cougars, Greg Rubel. All right, so we are back at the Glass Bowl here in uh, Toledo, Ohio. Final score is a 28-21, to 21, Toledo over BYU. Just a quick reset right now with Mitchell Jurgens down at the Cougar Locker Room area based on what he's heard already from Kalani and players. And let's talk first about uh, the situation involving Zach Wilson. And it's it's fair to summarize that uh, Kalani believed Zach would be out for a time. Is that accurate? Yes, that's what it sounds like um, so far in the post-game interviews. When I did see Zach go in or come out of the locker room, he did come out for a brief moment to to greet the other players after the game. And he, he, I mean, his it looks like it might have been a thumb on his throwing hand, um, but I mean, he held it as if he couldn't move uh, his hand at all. And so it looks like a pretty serious injury. I'm not not sure on the timeline of when he'll be ready to go, and so it definitely sounds like Jaron Hall is going to be the guy, and they've got to rally around, uh, you know, behind him as the as the guy to lead them to the next couple wins. All right, uh, and, and now BYU does have the benefit of, of a bye week, and Kalani's aware of that. But even with the bye factored in, it sounds like this could be something that keeps him on the shelf for a bit. Yeah, absolutely. And um, you know, when you look at thumb injuries, especially as a quarterback, I'm sure Riley could probably talk a little bit more to this, but. I mean, as a quarterback, you're throwing hands everything, and so if if you're not 100, percent even if even if you feel like you can you can go out in there and compete, having a, a hand that's that's not to full capacity can be more detrimental. So I'm sure they're going to take you know every opportunity to get him healthy uh, and back fully 100 percent before he steps on the field to to be here with his guys. Okay, Riley Nelson, let's bring you in. Uh, you've heard uh, from Kalani and players here post game. Just uh, general thoughts and reactions, both on the game and now the situation at QB. Yeah, I mean it's disheartening. These uh, they're they're taking it hard as they should. This was a game that throughout, especially in that third quarter, you thought you had it won, and then even down as late as when Chaz you made that strip, you you had that game. So. You know, Kalani gave us the coach's speak uh, at this point. You know, this is kind of our third disappointing loss uh, of the season, and so we're kind of getting the same answers, which which you expect. What's got to be different is what happens during the week. You you have to self-evaluate, and you have to be very honest with yourself and and, and change your practice patterns. And as far as uh, Zach Wilson's hand is concerned, yeah, I mean, your thumb is absolutely must be there because as you think about it, you have four fingers on top but the thumb is the only one on the bottom side of the ball and so it's absolutely imperative that your thumb is in good good shape and even if it's his other fingers I mean maybe get away if it's a pinky or a ring finger injury but if it's your index your middle or your thumb th- those are your power fingers and ones that are absolutely vital to the gripping of the football and uh, so hopefully it heals and heals quick. I hope it's a fracture and not a ligament injury, but uh, I don't want to sit here and speculate. Wish him the best and a speedy recovery. Okay, we'll take a break. We'll come back and head back down to the Cougar locker room with Mitchell Jurgens after this on the new skin, BYU Sports Network. This is the Cougar Locker Room Show on the new skin, BYU Sports Network. Now back to the voice of the Cougars, Greg Rubel. All right, so welcome back to the Glass Bowl here, Toledo, Ohio. Rockets beat the Cougars by a score of 28-21. Official attendance, uh, 24,889. Heading down to the Cougar Locker Room area with BYU offensive lineman Keanu Seliaponga. Keanu, thanks for taking a minute. We appreciate it. Thank you for having me. You know, really felt like BYU had uh, earned some uh, s- some some well earned momentum up fourteen to three. Things were kind of clicking a little bit, and then the game switched uh, pretty dramatically. And this was a game of swings. As you look back on this last sixty minutes of football, how would you describe it? 
Um, first off, hats off to Lido. They, uh, they came out to play today. Um, as far as us and uh, as far as what happened, uh, we came in with the right mindset. We just didn't execute. As you uh, think back on this uh, on this game and the chances and capitalizing uh, on opportunities, how do you how do you practice so that you can capitalize on those opportunities more? Or what maybe needs to be emphasized on what you're currently doing? Or maybe what could you be doing different or, or a change in practice? And I realize we're just moments post game, and that might be a hard question to ask. But I wanted to get your thoughts. Uh, yeah, well, good thing uh, we have a bye week coming up. So we, we'll look over the film and, and uh, look at our problems, look what we need to fix. I know myself, uh, some plays, I, I didn't take the right technique. But as far as practicing, um, uh, we just got to watch the film and, and trust our coach is going to put us in the right position next time and uh, trust that they'll um, make us practice the right technique and whatever we need to do to execute next time we step on the field. Keanu, third downs and short have been kind of problematic for BYU this season. What's your take on it? Uh, yeah, uh, we just need to know, be more uh, situation awareness um, and being aware of the third and shorts. Uh, we felt we fell short on a lot of uh, third and shorts today. But again, that's something uh, we need to work on and we're still working on the season. Uh, but like I said before, we're just blessed to have this bye week and uh, we're going to work on everything. What do you want to say about the job uh, Soup and Lopini did uh, trying to fill the shoes of Tyson Williams, a really important player for you guys? Oh, man, I think they did a, a really good job. They came out and uh, were ready to score. Um, yeah, so I think they played a big role in our su- success, the success we had early. And, uh, yeah, hats off to them. Sticking with that theme on the run game, it was uh, 44 pass attempts to 23 rush attempts. When you guys talk about you know coming into a game plan, and maybe you don't get specifically down to attempts because you kind of have to go with the flow of the game, but in an ideal game or, or, or the perfect game, does this BYU offense want to be balanced, run, pass, or uh, or is it more two-thirds, one-thirds like we saw today? Um, like our uh, Coach Mateos always preaches to us um, on the road, if in order to win on the road, you got to run the ball. So uh, our mindset was to, to get a lot of success um, in the run game. But uh, like any other game, um, things happen, and uh, sometimes you need to change the game plan. But today we just didn't execute. Tough to say how long it's going to be this way, but uh, without Zach Wilson and with Jaron Hall, uh, how does that change you guys? Uh, it doesn't change, change us at all. Um, those two are our are, are top two quarterbacks for a reason. Um, they have a good amount of reps, equal reps during practice, and uh, no matter who steps up, we're – me and the O-line is going to protect for them. And uh, whoever shows up, they're going, to, they're going to play their hardest. Not the ideal way to head into a bye week, of course, uh, Kiana, but what do you guys want to get done as a unit before you uh, kind of gird up and get ready for the next phase of your season here? Um, just trusting in, in uh, execution and, and the positions that our, our coaches put us in and just learning from our mistakes. Um, we've got to watch film and, and learn all the techniques and, and little things that we didn't do. Um, well enough today but uh yeah as far as uh this bye week we're going to take it as an opportunity to get better and to better our offense and defense and special teams keanu thanks for the time we appreciate it safe travels thank you appreciate right. it that is a byu's starting right tackle keanu Saliapanga as byu falls today by a score of a 28 21 to toledo the rockets go to three and one byu falls to two and three heading into the bye week we'll go one-on-one two-on-one riley and me with coach kalani sitake coming up here on the new skin byu sports network Postgame coverage of BYU football continues with the Cougar Postgame Coaches Show, brought to you by Mountain America Credit Union, guiding you forward. Let's rejoin the voice of the Cougars, Greg Rubel. All right, the Kalani Sitake is forthcoming, and as soon as we have the coach on the headset down at the Cougar locker room, we will let you know and get him on the air. In the meantime, let's hear some opening comments from the winning coach here today, Jason Candle, the head coach of the Toledo Rockets. He spoke with media a short time ago. And our appreciation, our appreciation goes out to uh, intern James. James Havel was the man down at the locker room and getting these comments from Coach Candle. His team defeats BYU 28-21 here today. Very proud of our football team and the effort that um, it took to, to win that game. You know, a real strong second half and, and a lot of uh, all three phases, really, and a lot of tremendous individual efforts by guys. Um, many moments of adverse times in that second half that we could have folded and we didn't. We rallied together and stayed together just like we've preached and talked. 
And I think, you know, once you, you set the mantra of what your program is to be in, you know, in January and you hope that these words that are all over these walls, they come off the walls and they start to become action. And uh, for that 30 minutes, I thought our guys did a really good job of staying together. And some of these things that we talked about all the time uh, showed their face. And uh, for that, you know, I'm really proud of our team because, like I said, many a times it's really hard to, to do what you said you wanted to do as a young man. And uh, it's really harder to do that when you give more of yourself than what you take and you come together and do that together. That's really special. And when you do that, you have the, you have the opportunity to have moments like we had today. So, um, you know, really proud of our, our team, like I said, and, you know, really happy that our fans came out and supported this team today in a, in, a, in a noon contest. It wasn't an easy week for us coming back off that trip, and our guys never used that as an excuse. They just kept battling, kept fighting, and uh, kept playing hard for one another, and that's what we asked them to do. Well, I thought he was awesome the other night, too. Um, you know, a couple of days ago when we played at 2 in the morning, we, I thought he was really good that game. Um, you know, really good finishing runs, really good doing a, a good job of getting the ball to the safety and punishing that safety when that safety came to, to, to put his pads on him. You know, him and Bryant are a little different when they get into the secondary. That guy's going to put his head down and try to run through tackles. Bryant's going to do a good job of trying to make you miss and get around you. Um, and break arm tackles. So it's a nice combination. Those guys have kind of fed off each other the last couple of weeks, and, and we're going to need that to continue because, you know, I, I don't know what we had rushing at halftime, but it wasn't very much. And, you know, I saw another 200-plus yard rushing game to, today, I believe. Um, and when you're able to do that with two backs and you're not just relying on Mitch to supplement that extra rushing yardage, I think that's a really key. Uh, it keeps the defense off balance. It doesn't make you – obviously, it doesn't make you one-dimensional, and it makes you really hard to stop. Well, it, 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 you have to have the opportunity to do it. I mean, obviously, you have to be put in a really hard situation by a good program, you know, and we were, you know. So you don't, you don't get to simulate that stuff up on Carter Field. You don't get the chance to simulate that in the glass bowl on Tuesday morning at 8.30 when people are walking to class past you. Um, you get a chance to simulate that on a Saturday afternoon in front of your great crowd playing a traditionally rich program that's, that competes their tail off. Um, that's a well-coached group that I got a lot of respect for. Um, and I'm glad they put us some some tough moments today because our kids responded in a positive way. It let, teaches me a lot about our team. That fourth and three where you guys were down 14-6, was there any doubt in your mind that you guys no. needed that spark? No. No doubt. And no doubt if we scored, we were going for two. You know, we had to – you know, we, we were down a possession because we didn't get to start the third quarter with the ball. Um, you know, I knew that possessions were going to be at a premium and we had to try to generate as many points as we possibly could. And, you know, sometimes those decisions come out of frustration maybe because your offense isn't having the success that you're having. But whether we had scored four or five touchdowns in the first half or not, I think I think that's still the play there. What does, I guess, I'm sure in some ways it makes it even more special knowing that there was so much adversity. I guess what does that say about how good this team can be that you guys have three or four daggers in the second half and yet still? Well, I think it tells us that, you know, after four weeks of football, we're starting to create an identity. And, you know, they said they came up with eat at the beginning of this season. They wanted to play with great effort. They wanted to be accountable to one another, and they wanted to play with toughness. And um, and that's what they said. So when they say that, that gives me something to hold over their head to make sure that that's the standard that they wanted to become. I really have a really solid senior leadership in this group. Um, it gives you a chance in hard moments and hard, t- hard times like, we're gonna, like we had. The cool thing about that is there's more of them coming. You know, and there's going to be plenty of other opportunities because some guys today didn't handle this well, okay? But there's plenty more of opportunities just like this coming down the, down the line for them. And, you know, whether it's football or whether it's life, that's what you're looking for. You're looking for growth. You're looking for, you know, these life lessons that we are allegedly teaching these young guys to, to show up and have an opportunity to where they can put a smile on the face and know that they, they hit it out of the park on that. So um, it, it's going to be a tough conference schedule. We've got a really tough game here next Saturday. You know, our guys know that. Uh, we'll have to be prepared to play a great football team here uh, next week. You know, like I said last week to our team, the, the commissioner wasn't out in Colorado waiting to hand us a conference championship after the game last Saturday. So, and he wasn't here again today. So, uh, but next week, every game counts. So, we've got to be ready to roll. All right, that is a Jason Candle, head coach of the Toledo Rockets. He goes to 31-14 and 14 in his fourth year. Kalani Sitake falls to 22-22 and 22 in his fourth year. We'll hear from the coach coming up. Final score is Toledo 28 and BYU 21. Tough one for the Cougs. Cougs who led at halftime and the Cougs who led after three quarters, normally really good indicators of success for BYU in the Sitake era. 
And BYU went against trend today, unfortunately, falling 28-21. The Cougs outscored 14-0 in the fourth quarter to fall to 2-3 and three on the year. We continue from the Glass Bowl after this on the new skin, BYU Sports Network. You're listening to the Cougar Post Game Coaches Show on the new skin, BYU Sports Network. Now, back to the voice of the Cougars, Greg Rubel. Toledo 28, BYU 21, our final score today here at the Glass Bowl in Toledo, Ohio. BYU head coach Kalani Sitake joining Riley Nelson and me now uh, from Toledo. Uh, coach, uh, you shut out the Rockets in the first quarter. You led at halftime, led at three quarters, and then the fourth quarter, uh, things just kind of got away from you there. How do you look back on uh, today's 60 minutes? Exactly that. I thought we were inconsistent as a team, and, uh, you know, defensively we were doing pretty good and then uh, gave up way too many plays in the second half and uh, offensively couldn't score, couldn't couldn't get it, get in the end zone, couldn't make field goals, and um, that that's uh, the outcome. We, we kept this thing way too close, and, uh, you know, Toledo made plays in the fourth quarter. We didn't, and so that, that cost us to win. Um, got no choice but to get better and, and to work hard, and that's uh, – you know, we, we have a week off that, that we have to really can't take it off. We have to get better and find a way to, to you know, improve and, and execute at a high level so that we can uh, have this win against South Florida. Dramatic swings <coughs> in the final few minutes of this game. Uh, you end up getting a takeaway deep in your own territory, but you've got the ball in a tie game, and the very next play, it's an INT that ultimately decides this one. It, it, went, it went pretty high to pretty low pretty quickly, didn't it? Yeah, and, and you know, I, I thought... Uh, I had to look at that play again, but, uh, you know, we, we had three timeouts. We could have done anything. We could have done a lot of different things to, to see where uh, where we could get. And, um, you know, that that's the play we came up with, and that's the, the turnover cost us. You know, after we made uh, a stand and getting the ball back, that, that was uh, the momentum was lost again. And so it seems like whenever we could generate momentum, you know, we get a big score from in the second half from our offense, and then our defense couldn't hold. And, and um you know, we've got to do better. We've got to do better as a team, and like, that's my job. I've got to get that done. It's one of those rare games where you lose on a plus two in the turnover margin just because of how crucial that one uh, giveaway was there at the end. So let's maybe uh, uh, readdress for those that may have missed it, uh, the status of uh, Zach Wilson, who got gets hurt on that play, right, the pick? Yeah, yeah. So um, we don't know the exact details on, on the, the the time of it all. We just know that he's hurt, confirmed that he's injured, and uh, – Looking like he won't play in the South Florida game. Maybe more than that. We have to get the, uh, you know, uh, that's just coming off of what we're what we can. We're limited here. We don't have all the specialists. But um, looking at it, it seems like there's going to be some significant time. But uh, definitely going to miss the South Florida game. So uh, we've got to get ready to for Jaron and and Baylor and and Joe. Those guys got to be ready to pick it up. What's the injury? It's uh, to his throwing hand. Um, I don't know the exact specific issue with it, but. Uh, there's there's something wrong with his throwing hand, and that that for a quarterback that's uh, that's hard to deal with. Coach Riley here. Um, the f- for a consistent theme and a time of possession, it's more what you do with that time than actual time of possession. But it was uh, we, minus ten again uh, today, and I, that's uh, as I look at the stat sheet with our backs. And if you include Jaron, because he caught a couple, you know, he caught a quick toss and that. But between. Emmanuel and Lopini only 16 carries. If you add Jaron's in there, there's only another 18. It, is there, well, and, and uh, it's hard to ask you this without seeing the film, but would there ever be a point where you make a commitment to get a certain amount of runs, if nothing else, to keep the offense out there longer and then to try and establish yourselves physically against a team that you're, you know, at least on paper, bigger and stronger than? Yeah, I, I think that's something that we have to really um, evaluate and, um, you know, looking at what we can do to, to just wear people down. We think we have a physical line, and I don't know if we're taking advantage of that enough, but um, I'm evaluating all of it, and, and uh, we have to make some really uh, tough decisions in the next little bit to get ready for our game. But all that stuff is going to be evaluated, whether it's scheme or uh, are we balanced or things like that. But uh, that's something that I'm, I'm, you know, I'm looking at it and looking at the stats and um, trying to see what will give our guys the best chance for success. And, and uh with Zach being out now, we might have to lean more on that. With Jaron being on, on, you know, as one of our quarterbacks, he he has a little bit unique um, strengths that are different than than the other. So um, all that stuff, it's hard to say without watching film. But yeah, I don't I don't know if we were able to take advantage of our size and our presence on the line of scrimmage. 
Kalani, third and short's been a grind for BYU this year. Uh, BYU's one for four on third and three or shorter today. There were false starts on third and one and third and two that aren't counted in that group. And and on third and one this year, BYU's four for nine. And, and teams are never under 50% on third and one. What are you seeing on the third and short stuff that's just not clicking for BYU right now? Well, it comes down to the execution. And that's, uh, you know, what are we going to hang our hat on in that time? Um, shouldn't be a lot of... Uh, guessing and should, we should be able to know already the, what play we're going to go with and then there's probably a few of them that you can go with that you got to hang your hat on and develop an identity and we're, we're already five games in and we've got to have that established and so uh, to me it, it's, it's something that, that uh, I'm concerned about and, and we have to do a better job otherwise we end up punting uh, on, a, on a third and short situation I hate doing that. Right. You, you lose Zach Wilson for a bit. We don't know how long. How equipped is Jaron Hall to do most of, if not all, the same things you were having Zach Wilson do, particularly relative to deep balls, which you got a couple of today? Yeah, he, he, he actually has a good arm and, and a very, very accurate arm. I think you saw a lot of it in the spring game and everything. So he's capable of doing it all, but it's just more of what is going to be suited for his skills and and his strengths. He's a little bit different than um, – than, than Zach and in, in the way he plays. So, I, I, but more than anything, this is like a, a an entire uh, unit issue. You know, we've, we've got to find a way. What's our best plays? And I think our receivers d- did some really good things today. But um, you know, we can't just sit there and think that uh, we're going to aerate this thing and, and be able to establish our presence that we want on the field. Coach Chaz, you sh- strip was uh, towards the end of the game to get you guys the ball before the kind of fatal interception was a tremendous play and uh, Kavika had one it got overturned but has there been an added emphasis on the defensive side of the ball at ripping and punching uh, as you swarm and rally to tackle guys that the guys who arrive second and third try and get that ball out because that could prove to be big as the season plays itself out yeah and that's just a high effort these guys play hard you know and um, it's an emphasis that they've been trying to capitalize on they know how important these uh, these turnovers can be and and um it's just a it's a it's a weird thing to have these many turnovers but we, you know when we came into the game we said we wanted to handle the run and i don't i don't know if we did that well enough to my liking you know especially in the second half and um we they were able to keep some drives alive because they were able to establish a run game and that's not something we we can't couldn't let happen this game but, but the guys are going to keep trying to strip the ball but still that's just that's a that's part of playing hard. I think uh, more than anything, we've got to be more assignment sound and stop the run. And the run game, Kalani, for them really wasn't established until the second half. You guys did a good job doing what you wanted to do in that first half uh, on the ground defensively. Yeah, I thought, I mean, our guys played really stout, but then they, they started to really buckle down and, and trying to force the ball to, to Kovac and, and trying to run the ball inside, you know, and then they worked their RPOs. And uh, I think our defense um, just on the field too long, and it's, it's their own fault. You know, being out there and not getting out of um, third and long situations. And then uh, we got in a position where we were had them in a good spot. And the next thing you know, we get we get a, a penalty for late hit. And, I mean, there's just a lot of stupid mistakes. And uh, that, it comes down to discipline. And I'm the one that's got to enforce that on, on our team. And that's, that's, uh, that's something that needs to get done right away. And if it's personnel, then fine. But, if you know, that's something that we've, we pride ourselves on, on, on being a disciplined team. But we didn't show it today. And in spots and then and uh, that might add to our inconsistency as a team and you do pride yourself too Kalani on rush defense which has always kind of been there for you guys but this year has been a tough it's been tough to stop the run the teams have put up some big numbers on the ground against you including today with uh, 242 by Toledo yeah and 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 they should keep trying to run the ball on us you know until we we uh, show that we're going to stop it and so that that uh, comes down to scheme and, and a lot of different things with our strategy and our players play hard, so I'm going to evaluate everything. And um, you know, we've got to get we've got to get better. We we have to do better against the run. That's something that that you cannot do. Then uh, we've been in this system for a long time, and and if that means that um, you know we have to go back to what we're really good at, that's what we got to do. And I thought we did that in the first half, and maybe got away from it a little bit. Uh, the rush numbers against this year: uh, 262 Utah, 242 Tennessee, 171 USC, 187 Washington, then 242 Toledo today. Of course, they ran for 436 last week. It's what they do and, and do pretty well. Was there a time today, Kalani, where you felt like uh, like this game was where you needed to be to, to end up with the result you wanted? Well, I think we're up 11. Up 14-3. Yeah, and and, uh, and and it seemed like we were able to just kind of settle down a little bit, but then we couldn't get off on that one drive of defense. And I think they, they kicked a field goal, which was okay, right? But 
Um, and then our offense wasn't able to capitalize. I think we had another third and, third and short situation. We had to end up having to punt. I mean, I'm, I'm not going to, as much as I want to go for it, I'm not going to go for it on the 30-yard line. And even though it's a half a yard, we have to be smart. And we were able to pin them deep on some spots and uh, just just really disappointed in, in, in all of it, how, how it worked out. But um, the players play hard, and the coaches got to do a better job. Uh, Jake had missed uh, two field goals for his career coming into today, and he misses two on this day and goes over two. You say he wasn't feeling well today? Yeah, I mean, the missed field goals will make you feel sick too, you know. <laughs> so um, I think he, uh, you know, we, we went with Skyler because Skyler was feeling it, and that, that's why we traveled the two kickers. I think Jake was doing okay with the punts. Um, but, you know, he might be overthinking a lot of the kicks. I mean, he just wasn't getting the good pop. The one that hit the upright, that wasn't usually at that distance he kicks the ball over the uprights you know and so it wasn't coming off his foot as well as, as we wanted to see it and and um you know he's he we, were, we had to go look at it again and see if these guys compete i think uh personnel wise we're gonna have to compete with everyone and, and get the best guys on the field coach uh Aleva had a tremendous day not only receiving with that big with that first touchdown at the half but I want to ask you about the return game a little bit. It looked like at least the second one when he broke the tackle and got around the edge, that was a punt safe, so it didn't look like he had a return up there. But I want to give you the opportunity. Were these set up returns or were these great individual efforts by Leva Hifo? No, both of them were returns. And so the um, you know we, we saw something on the film. A.J. Stewart and Ed Lamb handled the, the punt return duties. And, and um, you know, we felt like we had a good chance if we can get him to punt the ball to us. Uh, I think the earlier... He had some fair catch situations, but uh, I thought that, that was a good scheme for us. You know, I I, I think t- special teams wise we did okay, but our punt returns and you know punt coverage we we were decent, and then I, I think the kickoff cover were okay. That's just the field goals was was the main issue. Last uh, couple of things for you, uh, Kalani. In the last decade, BYU's had literally one season where one quarterback goes all the way start to finish, and that was Taysom Hill in 2013. It's tough to get through a year with one guy, and you're already finding out again pretty early that you need more than one, right? Yeah, and and, and uh, this is frustrating, but, you know, we, we uh, feel really comfortable with our guys, and I, I like what I've seen from Jaron and, and the improvement he's already made, but um, I also feel really good about Baylor Romney, and I feel good about Joe Critchlow too, so uh, they have a good coach, and, and uh, I think the key for us is to make it so that Jaron can play fast and, and, and uh, utilize his strengths. That, that's a little bit unique and different than what we have with, with Zach. But um, I think for the most part is we just can't have him thinking too much. And, you know, I thought he, he responds well. He's a gamer. The guy wants these opportunities to step him and play. He wasn't afraid of the moment when he got in there uh, towards the end of the game. But um, now we, we have some hard work to do, and, and we'll get them ready. Tough couple weeks. You lose your starting running back, Tyson, last week, starting quarterback, Zach, this week. And, and before the game, Kalani, I knew, di- I knew he didn't want to talk too much about what 2-2 two and two said about your team. What, what do you think about your guys at 2-3 and three heading into a bye week right now? Yeah, we've got some work to do, and, and, and it's time now to, for a gut check, you know, and see what we're made out of and, and for our depth to step up. We have some guys that are banged up and some opportunities now for the young guys and other guys to step in when their number's called, and let's see how they, re- they respond. But... I think coaches, we got to do a better job of getting them in a position to have success, and and that's my main objective right now. So I, uh, the guys work hard, they play hard, and and uh, you know we just need to buckle down and make sure the right guys are on the field and that we got the right scheme going with them. What'll be your plan for the bye week here as you get ready for South Florida here in two weeks? I think we're going to work. We have to work through it. You know, uh, um, we'll let some guys heal up and everything, but uh, we go into it with practices starting next week, and uh, you know that that and. We'll, we'll let them get some, some rest, but our focus is going to be on South Florida the entire time and getting our scheme on, on all three phases ready to roll. Well, as tough as it was today, Kalani, your guys still gathered to uh, to acknowledge the fans and do the fight song, and there was a lot of BYU blue here at the Glass Bowl. I know you always appreciate it, and it's a tough one for the fans and your guys today, but uh, they showed out, and I know you, you do respect that. I do, and, and love our fans. I appreciate them being here and cheering, and they, they, they uh, made us feel at home, you know, on the road, and uh, just really disappointed we weren't able to get the win for them. But our players love them and appreciate all of them. And so I just wish everyone safe travels back home. And, and uh, we'll get we'll get back to work. These guys are, are, are dedicated to working hard, and, and we'll find a way. Safe travels to you, too. We will see you back in town. Thank you, sir. Thanks, guys. All right, that is BYU head coach Kalani Sitake. Cougar Nation Now is coming up next. You want to use a hashtag BYUCNN to reach out to us on Twitter to give us some discussion points. Hashtag BYUCNN. 
or you can email us, Cougar Nation Now, one long word, Cougar Nation Now at byu.edu. Toledo 28 and BYU 21 is our final score as we continue our postgame coverage on the new skin, BYU Sports Network. Football season is an exciting time of year. You're tuned to BYU Dining's Cougar Nation now. BYU Dining, a classic BYU tradition. Have a scoop today. Be a part of the show by emailing your questions to CougarNationNow at BYU.edu or tweet your questions using the hashtag BYUCNN. Let's head live to the Mo Betta's broadcast booth and join Riley Nelson, Mitchell Juergens, and the voice of the Cougars, Greg Rubel. We are in the Glass Bowl here in Toledo, Ohio, where today an official announced crowd of 24,889 saw the home team go to 3-1 and one on the year. They'd already played one home game. It was an FCS team, so their first FBS game here it was uh, well attended, not nearly a sellout or overflow as it might have been the hope, but uh, it was a home crowd that saw their team come back from down two scores, pitch a 14 nothing fourth quarter shutout, and get the win over BYU by a score of 28 to 21. Greg Rubel and Riley Nelson with you in the booth will soon be joined by Mitchell Jurgens as he makes his way up from the sideline area. This is BYU Dining. Cougar Nation now. Brought to you by BYU Dining and the BYU Creamery, which brings you inside scoop trivia. BYU Creamery, the classic BYU tradition. Have a scoop today. We'll get you a trivia question for a couple half gallons of famous creamery ice cream uh, coming up in a little bit. That's a, a nice way to end the day on a not-so-pleasant uh, day for BYU football fans. Cougars had this thing, I'm not going to say totally in control, but uh, um, w- w- with a certain measure of, uh, of momentum and, uh, and uh, maybe solidity at 14-3. to Riley, this is a 14-3 to game. Uh, they'd, they'd, hit, they'd hit on big plays. They were producing uh, in the ground game pretty generously. And uh, you know we're, we're going to talk about this a little more in depth, but when you get eight times into scoring territory and score three times, even if those are touchdowns, as they were, three out of eight is not a good ratio when in scoring territory, meaning the 35-yard line. And with Jake Oldroyd, we already know that 52 is scoring territory. So if you're at the 35, you should expect some kind of points. Eight times, three scores, and that wasn't enough today. Definitely not. And finish is the didn't finish drives and not finishing drives rolled into not being able to finish the game. Um, it, n- not only in the second half, the third quarter, fourth quarter, but you're right. When it was 14-3 and then Toledo got the ball and p- actually put together a pretty nice drive, but then the defense held strong, forced them to a field goal. BYU gets the ball back and uh, seems to be mounting a drive. And th- just kind of from there, it was hoping for a-, a big play, another Micah Simon play, right? Like, well, And you can't – those are going to be the exception and not the rule. You need to be able to take care of business when business presents itself – and that's not what was happening on the offensive side of the ball for BYU today. Uh, Ryan Lundgren uh, tweets in, and I was I was curious about this too. Micah was asked about uh, Jaron Hall, and I think Micah's response was, "I didn't even know he was in the game." On that, li- I, I'm assuming at some point he figured it out, but clearly he didn't know starting the drive. It sounded like to me like led that even Jaron was in. Ryan says, were you surprised that Micah didn't know about Hall entering the game until he was lined up on that last drive? I'm surprised there wasn't more prep on the sideline before the last drive. And it could be that really it wasn't until they came out to play that, that Zach figured I can't go on this moment. So, And w- would it be normal for you to know exactly who the quarterback is, uh, Mitchell, as a former wide receiver? No, I mean, you know, I don't, I don't fault Micah at all for not knowing. Um, w- when you... When you come off the sideline, too, a, a lot of times your meeting is your position group. And mm-hmm. so, you, you know, what the quarterbacks are talking about, what they're doing, it may be irrelevant to you. Um, what it sounded like, I mean, I was on the opposite side of the field, and so we were all kind of shocked when Jaron came out. I think right when right when Zach came off the field, he went straight to the locker room, and there wasn't much fuss about. I missed um, it. You know, this, I, I didn't see him leave the right. field. And, and so there wasn't a big, you know, ordeal about him leaving. And, and that's something, too. When you look, um, I actually had a coach once. Um, I think it, I think it was in high school. Um, we, we talked about you know if, if a quarterback goes down, the one of the worst things you can do is hype up that the backup's going in because you know some of the players may feel a little bit you know on edge like oh what are we going to do on this final drive without our starting quarterback, um, and, and, and so. It, you know, to a receiver standpoint, to Micah's standpoint, it doesn't matter who's throwing the ball. You just got to do your job, and and that's that's all that you know is is asked of of you individually. Riley, thoughts on that? Yeah, I'll share a little bit of personal experience here. So the one time I wasn't able to finish a game due to injury, 
uh, was I, I took a hit. It ended up resulting in a punctured lung, which turned into a collapsed lung. But I took the hit, finished the drive. I come off, and I'm sitting on the sideline. And normally, you know, whenever you take a big hit, I was one that would give it a while, like, the, you know, with the pain subsidized. See, all right, is this something that's legit or is this something that is just part of the game? Well, I was sitting over there, and the, my chest pain started getting worse and worse, and then I started getting a little lightheaded. So I go over and find, find the athletic trainer, just me. I was, uh, you know, I was sitting back on the bench and just one-on-one to the athletic trainer. He's saying, uh, those are some warning signs. And he took me back to the locker room without – being known to anybody else on the team same thing with a hand you know come off throwing an interception and you're kind of like man maybe you pick up a football and the pain feels really sharp or it feels more than just like hitting on on a helmet you go over to the trainer and the trainer's like yeah this is something we probably should look into and it's not like the trainer announces that to the sideline or to the offense he just gets you back to get you treating and so your teammates are really unaware of what's what's going on in situations like that obviously when you get hurt on the field and you have to get taken off everybody sees it so everybody aware but in situations where you can get yourself to the sideline often the trainer if he determines you need further evaluation takes you and doesn't really tell anybody okay clint edvilson uh emails in cougar nation now at byu.edu it seems he said that in the first half byu was using more of a four-man front and the run was more or less contained in the second half byu is more of a four a uh, three-man front almost exclusively showing a run box why did byu go away from what was working with the four-man front byu in the first half had given up in the neighborhood of 60 yards rushing and in the second half, that number went to about a buck eighty. That's a good question. The way I would first start to justify it is they had trouble. They came out in the first half with the four-man front, and Toledo was running a lot of tempo. And tempo does two things. Not only does it cause alignment problems pre-snap, but also it wears your guys down. So by switching to a three-man front, you get one more guy who's a little bit more conditioned and able to handle four, five, six string plays that are that are hurry up in a row. So I feel like they were trying to do that. And also, when you're when you're fourteen three or even fourteen six, you're assuming Toledo's going to try and put the ball in the air to fight their way back into the game. And so to have either a nickel package or a four linebacker package makes a little bit more sense. But that's a very good question and uh, something that I think as Toledo, you know, tied it up and made it 21-21, you put the big dudes back in there and don't let them run the, run the ball like they did. A uh, question from Bryant before we take a break. Bryant Walker says, with high-scoring football affair that college football seems to be these days, I feel that 21 points is simply not enough to win. The offense really needs to score more because 21 is not going to cut it most of the time. Would you agree? And I will tell you, A, yes, and B, the last time BYU won a game with fewer than, uh, rather with 21 points or fewer, was against Portland State, an FCS team. They've only beaten, uh, the last time they beat an FBS team at 21 or fewer was actually, oddly enough, in the state of Ohio back in 2016 at Cincinnati. They won that game 20-3. to So if you take out the Portland State game and since, the since you win, uh, BYU's not won a game at 21 points or fewer uh, at all. Uh, and that's, that's going back, you know, three-plus years here. And, and sure, you, you, you take 21-17, 20, however you get the win, you take it. But that said, BYU's not winning lower-scoring games these days. And again, 21 uh, puts you in the distinct minority of college football teams these days. The average, the median right now is 30-plus. And nor did Toledo get there. They ended up at 28 today. But that said, uh, BYU is going to be among the lesser teams currently in both points allowed and points scored. And the 21 generally puts you in the neighborhood of not enough. So I guess I would agree with you. Bryant, thank you. Cougar Nation Now at BYU.edu. That's Cougar Nation Now at BYU.edu to email us, to tweet us, use the hashtag BYUCNN, hashtag BYUCNN. Greg Grubel, Riley Nelson, and yes, Mitchell Juergens all up here in the booth from the Glass Bowl. We'll take more of your comments next on the new skin, BYU Sports Network. Let's get you back to Cougar Nation now on the new skin, BYU Sports Network. Well, the BYU team, as we talked about, that had really excelled in the Sitake era at uh, playing with a lead both at halftime and after the third quarter. BYU led after both of those instances and falls today by a final score of 28-21. So speaking of trending the wrong way, the last two times BYU's led at halftime was last year at Utah, loss, and this year against Toledo, loss. So, A, they haven't been leading enough at halftime to begin with, but then when they have been leading, lately they haven't been finishing, which is is troubling because it had been a really strong suit for Kalani in his first uh, three seasons-ish. Greg Rubel, Riley Nelson, Mitchell Juergens with you. We're in the Glass Bowl 
and uh, Toledo, Ohio. BYU falls to Toledo by a score of 28-21 today. So let's have you both uh, give us your thoughts on what happens now to a BYU offense with Jaron Hall leading the way. Uh, Zach Wilson is injured. It's a throwing hand injury. Uh, Kalani didn't tell us uh, of an expected duration of absence except to say it seems like it's going to be a significant time, amount of time. So that's what we know. Uh, we can't get into too many specifics beyond that, but they're planning for Jaron Hall against South Florida and possibly beyond we shall see. Uh, we'll go to the wide receiver first and then to the quarterback next. Yeah, you know, Jaron, Jaron Hall, w- one thing that I love about him is, is I'm a big fan of, of two-sport athletes. And, you know, Jaron Hall, he's, he's a baseball player. He's a, um, and I'm sure he plays other sports as well. But, I mean, you, you put an athlete back there and, and things are going to happen. I mean, we, you see that with... Um, you know, in in every sport, you just the the more athletic you are, it's only going to play to your advantage. And so, I really like that that aspect that he's going to bring to the field. But the thing that I like, and, and Kalani may mention to this, um, in in his post game interview with you guys, um, we go back to the spring, and he was incredible. Jaron Hall, he he was an accurate quarterback. A lot of people look at him and think that he's just this scrambling quarterback, but he has the ability to make the big throws. Um, it, it's going to take repetition. It's going to take. Um, getting used to the feel of the game flow. And, you know, for any quarterback, you're going to have your learning curves, as we've even seen with Zach. Um, but I, you know, I'm, I'm optimistic about what he can do. And, and his, uh, his ceiling is very high, is what I'm trying to say. I mean, you've, you've got a guy that, um, that can use, you know, both aspects um, as a quarterback to at his advantage, you know, his arm and then take his legs as well. And so um, I, I think also his ability to play in these games before is going to help him. Um, he's been used in different roles, and so he's going to take on this role. And, and I think, you know, from what it sounds like from the players, they're all confident in Jaron's abilities. Um, as a quarterback and as, as a guy who can lead this team um, for however many games that he's, you know, required to do so. Riley. When it comes to Zach, first I'll, I'll address Zach's injury, and obviously condolences go out to him and uh, a, a speedy co- recovery, whatever the diagnosis ends up being on his thumb. I, I learned this through hard experience, and, and, and that would be, I've always said, I, I experienced a, a lot of injuries, some more severe than others, but when I did hurt my back my senior year, I tried to push through it and play injured, and I hurried back, and I came, and I just was never right for the entire remainder of the season, and it affected my play, and I think, quite honestly, you know, that year we lost four games by a combined seven points, and it probably, and who knows to speculate, but it probably affected some of the outcomes of the game. Had I been at full strength, I maybe would have been able to make a player here that could have been the difference. Who knows there? So, bottom line is I would advise Zach, if I were, you know, Zach's, if, or even if I get the chance to speak with him, he needs to get 100% healthy, and especially when it comes to your throwing hand and releasing the ball and where part of why he's so deadly is he is so accurate with the football. Uh, take all the time you need in order to get back. Now, with this new-look offense, Kalani said in, the, in our post-game interview with him that uh, perhaps, at least at this moment, he's going to have to do some other film evaluation, but maybe they're not committed to the run. Well, one of the things that Jaron Hall gives you, we saw it with Guadani, we saw it with Toledo's quarterback. He was able to keep things positive with his legs. They weren't getting much going in the passing game. They were trying to run with the running backs up the middle of the defense, and the defense was being stout, yet he would be able to find 12 yards over here or on that you know, a third and 18 turn it into a fourth and manageable and it changes the decision making of the coach and gives you put yourself in a more positive uh, you know opportunity to potentially score and I think we get that with Jaron Hall the biggest thing for him because I've also been in his uh, his scenario and that's going to be he needs to be himself he needs to not try and be Zach he needs to be overly communicative with Grime, Coach Grimes and Coach Roderick in what he likes to run what he feels comfortable running and then go out there when he gets his shot in two weeks against South Florida and and just hmm. play loose. Now with Jaron Hall he may be a little more likely to take off even than than, than Zach Wilson and uh, the same problems that BYU is dealing with now could be problems with Jaron Hall if, if the Cougars aren't careful. He's got a good build to him, mind you, but you know it's it's uh, you don't you don't want to get down to number three as much as you might think that uh, Baylor Romney or Joe Critchlow can get the job done. Um, you want to keep it. You know, I prefer we that we went that through Jer- that in seventeen, was it, or was it sixteen? When did we play four different quarterbacks? What year was that? Um, 2017. 17. Yeah. 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 So, <laughs> yeah, that wasn't fun for anyone. Again, the, the, the thing that makes him dangerous is the thing that also causes you concern, and that's uh, keeping him upright and keeping him healthy. Bear, Jaron Hall, by the way, for the season now has run six times for plus two yards. 
I expect, expect those numbers to see a significant uptip, uptick as a lot of his previous usages have been on things like uh, fly sweep and or the fumble snap that counts against his negative yardage in the, uh, in the Utah game, I believe it was. Uh, he's thrown the ball seven times, four of seven now for 58 yards, with him going three of six today for 39. He had a passer rating of 104.6 in just that one drive. And that last play that he uh, tossed up was to Talon Shumway at the back right corner of the end zone. BYU didn't complete that, and the game was over on that play. BYU on the day ends up outgaining Toledo by a matter of seven yards, 455 to 448. BYU uh, more than a yard better per play over Toledo, 6.5 to 5.3. BYU plus in the turnover margin. A lot of things you like to see from BYU were there, but ultimately drive inefficiency was the killer. We'll hit it again. Eight times in scoring territory, three scores, five drives ending up in no points including missed field goals, turnovers on downs, and the end of the game. Hashtag BYUCNN. Hashtag BYUCNN to reach out to us on Twitter or Cougar Nation Now at BYU.edu on the email. Cougar Nation Now, one word, one long word. Cougar Nation Now at BYU.edu. Coming up next segment, we'll throw some uh, inside scoop trivia your way for two half gallons of famous creamery ice cream. BYU falls to 2-3 and three heading into their bye week. Toledo 28 and BYU 21 is today's final score. We're on the new skin BYU Sports Network. Let's get you back to Cougar Nation now on the new skin, BYU Sports Network. Well, I guess it's been that kind of day. Uh, This is Greg Grubel coming to you live from the Glass Bowl in Toledo, Ohio. We've run into some major technical difficulties at the tail end of our broadcast here today, so I'm reaching you via cell phone to close out today's broadcast from the Glass Bowl. Unfortunately, every uh, means by which we normally communicate with you have gone dead And so we're just going to say so long, and uh, we're going to put off our inside scoop trivia, courtesy of the BYU Creamery, until the South Florida game. We're heading into a bye week, and BYU's next game will be at South Florida on October 12th. Our final score today is Toledo 28 and BYU 21. Our thanks to our entire crew back at BYU Radio, our engineer, Sean Fay, our control board operator, Tanner Roll, our our coordinating producer, Terry South, our interns, uh, Jeff Carroll and Nate Slack, here in Toledo, our engineers, Michael Wimmer and Barry Squires, our intern, James Havel, and from my broadcast partners, Riley Nelson and Mitchell Jurgens, along with our studio host, Jason Shepard. My name is Greg Rubel. Thanking you for tuning in. We'll talk to you again for BYU football from South Florida on October 12th. In the meantime and in between time, this has been BYU football on the new skin, BYU Sports Network. So long from Toledo. You've been listening to live coverage of BYU football on the new skin, BYU Sports Network. Coverage of today's game has been brought to you by Siegfried and Jensen. Siegfried and Jensen has been helping Utah families for over 25 years. BYU football is also proudly supported by Ken Garf Honda, Nissan, and Volkswagen in Orem. BYU football is a production of BYU Athletics in association with BYU Broadcasting. Special thanks to BYU President Kevin Worthen, Vice President Matt Richardson, Athletic Director Tom Homo, and General Manager of Corporate Sponsorships Casey Stoffer. BYU football is an exclusive presentation of the new skin, BYU Sports Network.